Hello and welcome to the Genetics Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Short. My background is in population genomics and studying the genetic causes of rare disease. I did my PhD at the Sanger Institute in the University of Cambridge and have been in biotech since 2018 when I started Sonogenetics. Sonogenetics helps academic and industry researchers to run large-scale genetic testing programs that speed up their clinical trials, generate data sets for the next big breakthrough, and give participants the best possible experience taking part in research. Each episode of the Genetics Podcast, we bring you insights from the leading minds in genetics and precision medicine, including household names and Nobel Prize winners, as well as early career scientists and biotechs working on the next big breakthrough. Whether you are a scientist, entrepreneur, executive, patient advocate, or simply someone curious about how genetics shapes our world, you're in the right place. Thank you for listening, and let's get started. Welcome everyone to the Genetics Podcast. I'm really excited to be here today with Jacob Steinfeld, who's the co-founder, chief scientific officer at Phyron and an honorary research fellow at University College London. We're going to talk today about a really exciting new startup that Jacob has been involved in co-founding, which is a company called Phyron. They're a small company today, but I think they've got a really exciting and interesting mission that really centers around how do we get a better understanding of what, why we actually end up developing disease in the first place and what are the interesting and, and maybe not so obvious early markers of disease that we can pick up through machine learning and AI and looking at um, phenotypic data in a lot more detail rather than the really simplistic look we sometimes have around biomarkers that lead to disease. Can we develop a much more accurate and comprehensive picture? And for obvious reasons, this could help us to better predict disease before it happens and treat it, but also to inform drug discovery at the really earliest stages and help people design clinical trials that are a lot more likely to be effective because they have what I think Jacob will describe as more of a GPS type system, a next generation system for understanding how disease is actually caused and, and developed. So without further ado, Jacob, thank you. I'm uh, looking forward to the discussion today. Hi. Um, thanks, uh, Patrick, for the introduction and looking forward to the, to the, uh, to the conversation also. I would love to just start with Phyron. What made you decide to start the company? A little bit about what it does and also your your scientific background, your academic background that led you to this. It'd be great if you could talk a little bit about how those things came together and inspired you to start the company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thanks. So uh, what we are doing, um, uh, basically working in, in, in drug discovery, right? So um, everybody's interested and everybody wants to, to get their drugs um, uh, to the market um, because there's a massive amount of unmet need um, we have at the moment. Um, what we see is that like 50% of the trials at the moment, are, I mean, they fail because um, simply the medication is not working. The target oftentimes is not working or has some uh, safety um, uh, effects which are not not um, uh, uh, making it a viable um, uh, program and bring it to the market. And so this we have at the same time on the other side, uh, we really have that massive problem that we have no fundamental understanding of how many, many diseases um, develop. And, and this is really, um, uh, these two things together are what um, has been the reason for us to found Ferron, because we think they're intrinsically connected. Um, uh, they're intrinsically connected on like the most fundamental core questions um, uh, we face. They're connected in the part of, do we choose the right target to treat the disease? Do we have the right markers to identify the right people um, to guide the clinical development? And do we get the populations right to treat, try uh, the, the, do the trials in, and therefore um, uh, have the pivotal results we need to bring them to the market? And so this is sort of the the, the um, uh, vision we have, like using that understanding, that phenotyping, to build the GPS that map that gives us the evidence to really help the risk on the targets, on the biomarkers, and on the population. Um, so. That's about the company, and uh, there we work together with with partners. Uh, and uh, the question was, in terms of what made us found the company in the in, in the first place, and how did we get there? And um, I've co-founded the company um, with my uh, co-founder Tora Bergel, um, and uh, so uh, we both met at charity. So um, I was doing my postdoc at charity. Um, uh, uh, Tora was doing his PhD at at uh, charity, and we worked at risk modeling, and. Um, uh, for me, risk modeling uh, uh, came from, it was not a direct path. So I actually started out um, uh, wanting to come in, like loving to play with computers as a, as a child, but then sort of ended up uh, uh, really, really um, uh, liking more being with people and, and went to study medicine and really fell in love with, with um, the human interaction, the human part of, of, of medicine. 
uh, so for a long time thought really really um, uh, doubling in in there and uh, so you did like the standard like wet lap um, many people do right uh, you try uh, try uh, many things and uh, fell absolutely in love with the computational part of that uh, science so I did my wet lab studies um, uh, there in really deep alternative splicing um, but what I got really interested in is that self phenotyping part of things so like at the time, some of you might be familiar with it, like um, multiplex uh, stainings. Um, uh, there was like a N carpenter cell atlas, super cool things where you basically intervene on cells. You have multiple multiplex readouts to characterize them really, really well. And this is really how I got the connection from the computational into the medicine and the ML. And at the ML part, I mean, at the time, it was uh, a few years after AlexNet um, when all this deep learning really took off and so I was super excited about the potential we had there, but also all the time had my clinical rotations, my clinical work where I realized, look, actually we have such a problem connecting all this information in the first place. And it's just like all this theoretical potential, but the reality is so much more complicated. Mm. Um, was a bit in between sort of, sort of, I always sort of like cardiology and then wanted to start sort of on the interconnection of cardiology and, and science, I came to Berlin to Charity and uh, was working my first postdoc um, uh, sort of combination, um, and it's now the German Heart Center of Charity, um, on well, how can we build um, a risk models to identify um, individuals who will get cardiovascular events. So that's quite a, I mean, it's an extremely important question, but as a, as a, as a narrow question. Um, and uh, so work there on, on, on how we can possibly introduce polygenic scores to identify some individuals before they really get, get um, uh, um, uh, uh, clinical um, uh, uh, symptoms. Um, and that is sort of in that part, and then the second postdoc working with Dolly Langberg and sort of a bit more of the prognosis uh, part and getting also more into genetics, uh, realizing that the actual fundamental question is that we don't know for most diseases we have out there who gets disease in the first place who gets complications and this really has been uh, 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 the foundation for us in the combination with that massive problem that most programs fail and realizing that genetic support is a core aspect in that equation a core factor to the risk right biomarkers are core factors to the risk and making the trial effective are core factors to the risk, and they're all inherently linked to phenotyping. And this is why we are so convicted in building the GPS for the map to really now help people navigate these three issues, like the right target, the biomarker, and the population. Um, yeah, maybe you can talk about um, heart failure or, or cardiology more broadly as an example of... of um the gap between where we need to be and where we are today, because you know, I think you made the point that there's a very, you, we have very crude measurements of risk and progression today. And we know that they don't capture anything near yeah. what, uh, you know, what a, a, an archetypical GPS that could tell you exactly when you're going to get there, how you're going to get there, what the path is you're going to take. I really like that metaphor for that reason, but what's, what's missing and, and to what extent do we not know what is missing and and we've got to figure that out is is it yeah. that actually we have all the biomarkers but the difficulty is getting them together and making sense of it or is it actually there's some fundamental discovery work to do yeah um thanks so there are many uh this is, is a complex question right but um maybe uh, let me try um uh taking a, a typical disease progression as an example of what what uh is the problem at the moment. So yeah. I shortly touched upon the first part already, the primary prevention. So primary prevention of cardiovascular disease is a massive problem because at the end of the day, people don't feel they have a problem or a sort of a catastrophe building up. And at some point it's like, bam, and they have a massive problem where they nowadays typically don't die initially anymore, but they basically lose, I mean, heart muscle dies, they get into heart failure. And, and that's like a horrible disease with like a massive, burden on, 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 on the everyday life. So we, at the moment, have a few markers which are established to identify who will be at high risk if they don't have symptoms. So, I mean, the most sort of fundamental and strong one is, is a very silly one is age, right? Like the older we yeah. get, the, the, the sort of more risk we have. Um, and, but then there are like um, uh, others established, like um, some of them as is, is just a few, few examples, like uh, the cholesterol we have, um, the, in particular the LDL cholesterol, um, uh, some uh, hypertension we have, some comorbidities um, uh, we have, 
um, uh, like several of these uh, factors and um, blood pressure, um, uh, where we have like the typical scores, like many people of you might know um, the score, a CVD score, the Q-risk score, uh, which try to touch up some of them. Um, and it's really difficult to implement them at scale. And they're sort of, they're not actually as so, they're, they're much worse than we would like them to be. So we still have a ton of people coming in with a heart attack and we simply didn't get them on the right prevention treatment before. But I don't want to talk so much about sort of the clinical part of that because because this really is, is uh, here in this context also incredibly important for the for the um, uh, uh, development of these drugs. And so going on, uh, they come in and then they have a heart failure. In that case, it's probably heart failure most likely case is because uh, ischemia, they have the artery clogged. But there are a ton of other things out there. Like the signpost is they come in and they have chest pain, they have dyspnea, and then they have a few measurements, drop in intake, and, and, and they have an ECG-like changes, and then they have a, um, a coronary uh, 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 intervention. But there's a ton of other pathways there. Um, just one example, um, uh, uh, ATTR, uh, amyloidosis. Like you have very similar symptoms. Um, uh, like it's very easy to confuse it with uh, um, a heart failure phenotype. And still, uh, uh, like there is a massive burden, uh, and uh, we don't get it right. If we, uh, it's extremely difficult to get it right with the signpost and this system we have there in place at the moment. And so, this is our core conviction: why we think we need that map and we need to build that GPS to get that right. Initially, in a context where we use it for the discovery of the targets for the biomarkers. And getting the population right and prospectively um i mean it's a fundamental concept right we need a systematic quantifiable basis for disease and your question was what is actually the problem do we have everything there or, or and we just need to analyze it i mean the problem is on multiple fronts right so the first one is um uh, we fundamentally have only in the last 20 30 years the possibility to actually have information on so many people's like people like 100, 10, 100,000, up to million people um, uh, in the population measured. So the first time we actually can do that, and that's a requirement. And then only in the last years, we, um, uh, for many of these um, in particular broader essays, which give us a glimpse on where the world could be, like come available. So I'm thinking on, like we worked on, on, on some NMR metabolomics. Um, uh, yep. You can think of um, a lot of interesting uh, work done and with uh, more broad metabolomics or also um, proteomics. Um, the newest essays, I mean, basically advertising or basically offering up to like 11,000 um, uh, proteins measured at the time. Uh, so this is really, um, uh, the more complex these essays become, the more we cannot manually like analyze every individual part, but our conviction is that we need to use the tools we have at hand and they are data-driven to answer that simple question, who gets disease, who goes on having complications, to again, come back to these three things, like get the target right, get the market right, and get the um, yeah. population right. Yeah, and I think something interesting that you said there, there's a there's an obvious application of predicting disease early, which is in the healthcare system. We'd all like to know a lot earlier and, and we can make changes and interventions. But actually there's a there's at least I think to most people a less obvious route, which is the problem that you can solve in clinical trials with this, which is in, in heart failure in particularly. Heart failure in particular, you have to run trials for many years with many thousands of people for the reasons that you can't predict which of them are going to get heart failure. So you you enroll based on some very broad risk factors, age being one of them, but some of these other biomarkers, but then you're waiting for, you know, for years in some cases for people to actually have the event where it sounds like with this kind of approach, you could run clinical trials a lot more quickly because if you know with much more specificity, who's actually much, much more likely to go on and have an event, then you enroll fewer people, you put less people on an experimental drug that don't need to be because they're not going to have an event in that time. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that problem yeah. space and and what we might be able to do there, because it's, it seems like it's a little bit of a hidden bottleneck here. People don't really realize how many drugs maybe never even get developed in the first place because someone looks at a budget and says this clinical trial is going to cost me a hundred million dollars because it's going to take five years and you know if it could it, if it could cost half that then actually maybe we would do it yeah Th thanks patrick so 
the underlying thing there is if you develop a new drug, the core thing you need to do in the first place is you need to sort of de-risk your investment, right? Otherwise, you will not be able to sort of sort of get the thing going or it will be a oftentimes bad investment. So what this means is the initial trials, and if we know that 50%, 60% fail because the dry drug doesn't work, needs to be as cheap and as fast to prove that the drug itself has a chance to work. And that is a massive pressure driver. So, and as you mentioned, it's extremely complicated if I don't know exactly who in the population will get on, let's say, prevent the progression of heart failure. Um, uh, and that's exactly basically the problem we have. So to do that, to identify, we have basically, we have basically two core, core, core levers to, 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 to at play here. The one core lever is what's, I mean, this established concept is of prognostic enrichment is making sure that you include the people who will actually get the events. Uh, another uh, concept is something basically surrogate endpoint is quite quite a uh, common uh, used term. Uh, uh, if you can identify something uh, we can measure, uh, which will give us the answer whether the drug works, yes or no, earlier than waiting for many years um, uh, until uh, um, a hard endpoint is, is, is met, um, that's an option. And the core problem with these things is not that the principle is, is not clear, but it is that you oftentimes simply don't have the means to know who will get in or what to measure. And this is really where, where our core conviction again is, is the phenotyping comes in and where we see that uh, based on these population cohorts and based on the, the work we, we did and we're doing at the moment, you really can use that to uh, 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 filter out and stratify the population to tell, look, these people are going to have uh, 10 times or 20 times as many events uh, as others. Therefore, include them in the early trials. So I can basically be very specific and much more specific here. Um, how can we do that? Um, uh, we can do that, of course, uh, by looking at the age is oftentimes a good starting point. Um, uh, but there are so many things we can measure nowadays, and they go from the very basic things in, let's say, heart failure try most of these patients anyway will access to, to uh, some basic blood measures like um, uh, 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 the cholesterol levels. Um, we will have um, uh, many of these settings uh, ECGs available. Um, uh, so we know that in ECG there's a ton of hidden information we can simply extract and use to tell who is going to get these events more likely than others. And there is all of this amount of different data sources out there, uh, um, they are like echoes. They are like, I mean, depending on the trial, we can even consider uh, MRIs. Um, but there are also specific um, uh, proteins um, uh, you can use to um, uh, figure out who is going to be at a high risk. And what we see is that this map is not there at the moment. And this is really our core conviction that with that map, that can really give us the the entity we need to navigate, this is what you have to measure in these people to get the biggest likelihood that you have the right people in your trial. And therefore, the trial will either faster uh, get you to the answer, is the drug likely to work or not? Or you simply will have to include much less people. And there is some like, this is phenomenal thinking about it. Some of these like, like, um, uh, you can simulate it, but sort of you don't need so much sort of predictive information to really massively reduce the size of the size of your trial. And as long as the screening is somewhat scalable and cheap, there is so much potential and it's not used at the moment. So this yeah. is really um, uh, where is a core value for for the platform. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think it's a really great idea, and I've heard um, yeah, I've, I've heard this in the context of cardiometabolic disease, for example, perhaps you use something like a polygenic risk score or, you know, polygenic risk score in, in combination with some of the more conventional scores, obviously you wouldn't, you, there's no point in just using it by itself. You could think about new, some of the new technologies like proteomics. If, if we took, um, maybe we took an example of using polygenic risk scores, for example, to identify the top decile of people who are going to be much more likely to have an event in the time horizon of the trial. One of the things I've always wondered about is what, let's say that phase two trial is successful and you're actually able to show that there's an effect on the primary endpoint in that in that subset of the population. What, what would someone do for the phase three? Would they go after that 
small subset of the population again, or would they broaden out to the whole population and basically use the phase two as a little bit of a, a proof that the drug works in at least some subset of the population? Maybe you could talk me through how like a biotech company, for it seems like something that a, well, a pharma or biotech company would want to do to try to get that signal quickly in a phase two and figure out do I have something here? But then um, it maybe complicates the decision in the phase three, right? Because you haven't tested it in as big of a population as possible. Yeah. I mean, there's an inherent trade-off, right? Like um, if you sort of reduce the amount of the, the, the um, uh, population um, uh, viable for, for, for that trial, you reduce potential market later. But what we sort of, I mean, the things we heard in a lot of times here in these conversations is the core question have people, they want to make sure with as minimal investment as possible to really focus on their core bets. So they, they want to try many bets. And if they don't see the signals, they simply will not go on. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if they then on that basis go on, I mean, what if you have a good signal uh, uh, that gives you a massive amount of confidence because you have already this core factor sort of de-risked that number one can help you to get the sample size sort of right um, uh, you would need and therefore estimate what it actually would cost to get to that, to cross that bar. Or say, look, I mean, I might have to uh, uh, work together with uh, a, a very big pharma company to, 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 to find the trial um, or basically refocus um, uh, their bet on the, on the three other um, essays or programs they might have um, uh, where they see um, uh, they need to be much less stratification to get to clinical relevant effect. But yeah. at the core, sort of our core, sort of the core sort of conversations we have are around the risk everybody has on their minds. How can we make sure that the things are actually working as early as possible? And this is really the core question we, we perceive um, uh, and we, we uh, where we see the core value. Um, and maybe let me add like one thing there, like you mentioned the example of the polygenic scores. Um, I think it's an interesting example because everybody talks about polygenic scores and, and I mean, they're sort of really, really cool in the sense that once you have taken the genetic material, they're quite broadly accessible yeah. and available and it, you, can, you can use them for many things. But the interesting thing is that that's not just the case for like genetics. That's the case for actually any, like technically the case for anything you measure. And practically we know that many things we measure are relevant for diseases, not just for that, like for quite a broad set of diseases. Hmm. So for example, like take the example of an ECG. An ECG is, I mean, many uh, uh, diseases um, uh, have uh, uh, have cardiac phenotypes. Like I mentioned the, the ATR aminidosis before, like there's sort of many sort of in particular immunological, rheumatological diseases which have phenotypes in the heart. And they're at the same time, many diseases which are mostly sort of confined to specific measures because the tra traditionally <laughs> they're treated by certain specialties. Right. Which, so it's a very interesting thing. And what we know and what we found is, is that, that many of these data sources are really informative for diseases across specialties. And that's something, that's an opportunity um, uh, to number one, pinpoint which one for which disease, and then how can we scalably implement that in these decisions towards the target, towards the biomarker and towards the population. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting insight. So what, what does it then, what does that imply about what kind of data you need to build this GPS? Is it, does it push you towards wanting more larger and comprehensive population scale data sets like the UK Biobank, where you've got cross section of the population and they're just layering on more and more new interesting assays every year, right? They have NMR metabolomics, they have proteomics, they have imaging in a subset. But I guess there's also an argument to say, we need to go deep in some of these less well-represented populations. So how do you think about that? Um, you know, is, is it broad uh, or is it narrow into a heart failure population and you capture much, yeah. maybe more more relevant phenotypes for that population? Yeah. Um, the thing is, at the end, in the best case, you would have everything, right? But the practicals, you don't. So oftentimes, like our, what, how we see it is, you need these population-based cohorts and they're an amazing opportunity as a basis. Mm -hmm. as a basis to really 
make hypotheses and get an understanding of what matters for what. And that again sounds somehow silly, but we don't know that for the majority of diseases. We, we have no understanding how really the risk of uh, sort of how well we can uh, um, um, predict um, uh, the risk um, to have, uh, let me make out an example, um, uh, um, uh, a rheumatological outcome uh, based on an ECG. I mean, we have some links established here and there, like these signposts, but we have no fundamental data-driven understanding. And going from there, it's totally clear, like um, uh, we need a particular prospectively um, uh, enriched cohorts where we have uh, people who have um, diverse phenotypes of individual diseases. And I mean, there are a few sort of different ways around that. I mean, one is, I guess, the our future health is a good example, um, is sample size. Um, and yeah. uh, uh, um, But at the end of the day, what we think the direction needs to go is like this uh, massive health systems which routinely take care of, of, of people with very diverse specialty phenotypes. They measure a lot of um, uh, uh, diverse assays and they have associated biobanking. So you can, can really get the routine care interlinked with, uh, with the research and can really trace back and go back, look, these are now um, uh, 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 the specific populations I want to specifically follow up and go in. But that's more of a maturation, iteration, and, and where we want to go. And, and uh, uh, at the moment, um, uh, using like populations and using um, uh, our, like data are also not particularly um, uh, enriched is an is a, is a impressive opportunity, an amazing opportunity, and we're super excited about it. Yeah, is there a, is there a, sh what's the bottleneck there? Is there a shortage of um, kind of health system health systems that have very robust research arms and want to do these kind of collaborations or is it are they you know uh, are they too expensive because i i'm thinking like this is an interesting challenge in that most health systems in the us and in the world are collecting this kind of data at scale but getting access to it is um is probably the most difficult part i'm wondering how much you've tried to get access to some of these you know some of these kind of populations that you yeah. described and what challenges yeah. you run into yeah um, yes, the answer is, of course, I mean, uh, we are basically actively looking for partners there. Uh, uh, and um, the thing is that what we found is that many of these health systems are extremely interested of making, unlocking sort of the data they have there. And the phenotyping uh, is, of course, a core component of it, because the the, the, the images or, or the assays you oftentimes, I mean, they don't t tell you much, or at least not in a scalable way. So. Uh, what you need to do is you need nowadays so you have this massive opportunity with data driven approaches to unlock them but what is, is, is it has many complications because because what it need, means is that you need in these health systems a very very strong expertise to uh build up these these resources um and and, and i mean there's so many core challenges from the way of how this data is basically acquired in the first place how a blood pressure measurements in an ER gets in a system in the first place, then how to basically link that to somehow a standardized representation of sort of these signposts uh, in the first place. Uh, and they're like nowadays with SNOMAD and, 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 and many of the vocabularies, there are sort of the semantic um, foundations for many of these things. But to get the right people there in the first place that build up systems that alone on a technical level um, uh, sort of work to the extent um, uh, uh, is something many, many health systems struggle with a lot. And uh, so this is the first um, basically barrier. And the second one um, then is, of course, I mean, there are some who clearly identified um, uh, the value. And then, uh, I mean, uh, they, they work together with, with um, uh, uh, companies. And I guess with the obvious ones, uh, we also don't want to go too much into the names uh, now, but uh, we also like have conversations already work together. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Um, I think the way you described it makes sense in that it's it's just outside of their standard yeah. course of business, right? They're first and foremost trying to deliver care. And so to spin up a best-in-class research arm requires all the skills and expertise and time and things like that to clean the data and make sure yeah. that it's fit for that alternate purpose, which isn't really their their primary. Um, and so that that's where I think 
you know, big programs like the UK Biobank have uh, have just found a way through that. Yeah, well, it's not really even through the through the middle because they're not doing anything from a clinical perspective. They're kind of uh, really started on the basic research and then have, I think, over time they'll become more and more clinically relevant what they do. But I'm I'm always interested in the organizations or institutions that manage to thread that needle between the two. Like Genomics England, I think in the UK has done an interesting job of being both um, healthcare system serve healthcare system service first and foremost, but also doing a really robust job on making data available to researchers. But it's um, it's much more common that people just focus on one or the other, right? And don't straddle that line very effectively. Yeah. But I mean, at the end of the day, that feels like that is really one of the core opportunities, like moving into the next decade yeah. or decades, right? Because I don't remember exactly where this comes from. I still remember, like many years back in my in my studies, there was a, a I said in Germany, right? So so like um, there's a, a lot of I mean conservatism around sort of data sharing, and I think it was from Estonia, like a representative who who was there in a conference. He said that um, at the end of the day, every patient who who comes in the door um, uh, uh, feels the privilege of that, basically that that the care they, they they get um is based on the on the experience of all the other people um uh, who had received the care before mm -hmm. and uh, uh so is there's a strong sort of shared commitment to then also share back um uh, the data um uh, and the experiences learned um uh, from their case and the interesting thing is in most cases is exactly the people who are most at need who are the most open to sharing this and this is really where where um we see um, the amazing opportunity um, uh, to fundamentally sort of sort of increase and improve the possibilities we have. Absolutely um, uh, in the clinical, but also absolutely in the and the development and, and, and drug development from the initial yeah. target to the market and the population at the end. Yeah. On um, on a more personal level, how did you make the decision about starting a company versus um, continuing with academic research, medical pursuits? Because uh, I, I always ask this question because I made that decision myself about six years ago now to start a company instead of going into academia. But I think it's a, it's a very challenging decision that a lot of people come to in the end of a PhD or end of a postdoc or in the middle of the postdoc and, and try to decide if they're going to leave, you know, perhaps in some cases temporarily, but leave that world where they've spent so much time building a reputation, really going deep into a particular area. And then when you go and start a business, a lot, some of the skills are transferable, but then there are many other things that you spend years on that would not be rewarded in an academic context. I'm just wondering how, was it difficult or easy to make that decision of actually starting the company in, in the first place when you did? I think it was, it was, it, I, th I think at the end of the day, it was an easy decision because, I mean, I, I, I realized quite fast that I'm in love with science and I really got hooked on that question. So sort of, sort of how can we improve the understanding of who gets disease and at the end of the day, use that to, to make an impact. And uh, I know that there are many paths in, in, in academia and I had really great sort of also support there. Um, I could have gone and I could have been also happy with, but the opportunity to really build a team focused laser focused on 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 a mission on the mission to really move the needle and and see the impact of what you're doing with everybody aligned <laughs> on that uh, uh with the right incentives um is something where i'm convicted right now that that um I know that for the question and the ambition I had, that was the right decision to make at the moment. And I'm extremely excited sort of about the opportunities I had. Um, yeah, so it was uh, um, uh, really in that moment, the opportunity I saw, I, I simply needed to needed to give it a go. And to be fair, also like together, together as my co-founder, I think we had a really cool constellation where we both were really excited on, on going that. And now I really see so much need that every day sort of there is uh, um it feels it feels reinforced yeah that's a that's a good feeling and and um what have you learned like what, what have you had to learn especially skills wise that's been different from what you built in your phd and postdoc i mean i've never built a company before so uh, uh and neither has my i mean my co-founder at least in the part so so um there is i think the core learning has been that there's so much things going on that in every morning, you have to ask yourself, okay, what individual thing 
brings your company or brings you closer to where you want to go. So constantly aligning on where you want to go and then every day leave all the rest there and really making the head, making the decision. And that is sort of hard sometimes because everything is sort of important. Um, but it's also extremely gratifying because you look back then a month and two months and three months and you really see there's a nuts amount of things you can achieve if you are excited about something. Uh, there is, you feel there is value in it and uh, you have the right setting and can also sort of decide on where you set your priorities to a quite large extent. Um, yeah, so this is really um, uh, like the progress is, 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 is immense there. And uh, so this is certainly something something I and we had um, uh, to learn, um, but it's something which is extremely exciting because it moves extremely fast. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and what are you most focused on right now? Like we've talked a little bit about the the, I think, broad vision of what you're looking for. But in the next year, next two years, um, what are the kinds of things that you're most excited about? And, and feel free to make call outs if there are particular kinds of partners or other companies that you want to work with or, or that sort of thing to help you get there. If you'd say, I really need, um, yeah, I'm interested in accessing partnerships or data sets in this yep. particular disease area, or we'd like to help companies that are working in trials like um, like this. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about what, you know, in the, in the next year or two yeah. is going to yeah. make you really excited. Yeah. Um, so I think there are, I would say, three things. The first thing is that we see that there is this massive need, in, in particular sort of in, in, in also smaller biotechs, to get that guidance um, on integrating this evidence from the populations into their programs. We, we see there's this massive need every day. So uh, this I'm extremely excited working together, um, uh, uh, partnering with these biotechs uh, to help them um, using the best possible evidence for their programs. And this is something I, I, I sort of really learned to sort of really enjoy over the last month because it's a massive confirmation that we can provide value here. Yeah. Um, I think the second part I'm personally really sort of uh, excited and, 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 and um, looking forward to is, as, as we've talked about, I mean, data is really a core part of, of what, we, what, what we do. Um, and uh, we have like a ton of really, really exciting um, uh, ideas, um, uh, which um, we plan on materializing over the next months on on uh, moving some of the more unconventional ways of really getting the right data for that phenotyping case, like making sure we have um, the right enriched populations, making sure we have um, the right assays uh, measured um, in the right diverse populations. Um, so this is something I'm really excited about. Um, and the third part is, um, I think, more of an excitement sort of from a scientific technical point of view is like, I love sort of building things and notice how they get faster and better and mature and then seeing what comes out. And so, I mean, this is something which natural over the next one, two years, I know in two years, uh, it will look um, very different to how it looks now. And I'm extremely excited how it will look. And um, um, yes. Yeah, one of the things that's always stuck with me, I think this is the case with, um, with most things in life, but certainly with research and certainly with um, starting a company is you you often overestimate what you can do in a month, but you underestimate what you can do in a year. And so it's really kind of dramatic sometimes to look a year back and realize how much you've managed to do. If you're in if you're looking at a week or you're looking at a month, often it doesn't always feel like we've made a massive improvement because sometimes, you know, the improvements they come in fits and starts and they're not always all happening at once. But I I definitely share that piece with you that if you're uh if, you know, if, if you look back over certainly a year or two, then you'll be amazed at actually how much you you've accomplished in that time. As long as you're doing that thing you described every day, where you're picking the one or two most important things and you're really focusing on them, and you're coming back every morning to say like, "This is my focus for today. I'm not going to get distracted." Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you for doing this. This was a ton of fun. I, I learned a lot. If people want to keep track of you, if they want to learn more about the company, where should they find you? Um, they uh, can find me on uh, uh, Twitter, on uh, LinkedIn, or they can just uh, uh, drop us an email. Uh, 
Uh, they can find us on our website, um, uh, uh, www.ferryon.com. And uh, yeah, just mm -hmm. any of these channels, we're um, uh, very excited to hear. And I mean, think specific things or explore synergies and in, in, in the other uh, point people might be interested in. Wonderful. We'll put the link to the website in the show notes so people can find you easily. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time and, uh, and joining us. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for the conversation. Have a nice evening. Ciao. That wraps up this week's episode of the Genetics Podcast. I'd like to give a huge thank you to our guests for sharing their valuable insights and experience. And thank you as well to our listeners, as always, for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's talk, the number one thing I would really appreciate from you is if you could share it with a friend or colleague who you think would enjoy it as well. We would also really appreciate if you could subscribe to our show and give us a quick rate and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. Both of these things help us become more visible when people search for genetics and precision medicine podcasts. And we're always eager to hear from you. Please reach out to us with any questions or feedback on social media. You can find Sonogenetics on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit sonogenetics.com. Finally, a big thank you to the team behind the scenes who make all this possible. In particular, Amy Cousins and Sonia Shah, who produced the show, and James Pierce from Selective Frequencies, who handles the audio engineering. I'm Patrick Short, your host, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you, and we'll see you next time on the Genetics Podcast.